John 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you have gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None, of, none have been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace Church Online. So glad you've joined us today. One of the questions that I've been pondering as I look back on this past year is how 2020 has impacted uh, my walk with God and also how 2020 has impacted uh, your walk with God. I've been thinking about how you and I are different as a result of having lived this year uh, before the Lord. And I know for myself, I could name her a number of things. Uh, 2020 showed me more about myself uh, than I'd like to admit to. Uh, but there's also been some delightful surprises in 2020 for myself as well. But one of the main changes has been uh, in my prayer life. And I could try to describe that for you, I suppose, but it's probably best to simply say that my prayer life is different, and it's different in a good way. One of the great blessings of, of, in 2020 for myself was beginning my journey with the Ministry of Church Renewal. I joined a group of other pastors from across Canada and even around the world. There's a fella in my group from uh, Brazil and we meet together weekly to talk about um, hearing God and hearing God in his word, hearing God through the circumstances of life, hearing God through others and all the other ways that, you, uh, that God speaks to, to us. And all that hearing is centered around the practice of listening 
uh, prayer. Uh, my connection with that ministry is really timely, I think, because I really believe that the events of 2020 uh, either left you more prayerful as you felt the need to press more into God, or it resulted in you being more prayerless uh, as you let discouragement and fear uh, misshapen your soul. I hope for you that it's more the, the former. I hope that 2020 uh, reignites your commitment to seek God, uh, not only for your own well-being, but also uh, for the well-being of others, for our community. I know that many of you know the verse from 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. You know, God really does want to heal our land of Canada from sea to shining sea. And it starts when the people of God called by his name, that's you and I, humble ourselves and begin to pray in earnest and in repentance. His plan is to heal us so that the land then can be healed. He'll heal the land through the healing that takes place in us and as we are renewed it then it is the possibility for the for the nation uh, to be renewed as well you know if you were to ask any historian of major revivals that have happened around the world and at different times they will all tell you that these renewals and these revivals started with prayer so i'm encouraging you don't miss the voice of god and his purpose in this season it's a season of judgment i believe for the world and it's a season of discipline uh, for the church now is the time to rend our hearts before the lord now is the time to return to the lord in repentance and in keeping with that spirit of prayer the, the, that the lord is calling us to in this season uh, i want us to look at uh, what really should be called uh, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that's found in John 17, the prayer uh, that Kim read for us earlier. Uh, most of you know the Lord's Prayer, as you find recorded in the Sermon on the Mount, the one that begins with, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But that really isn't the Lord's Prayer as much as it's a prayer that the Lord gave the disciples as a model for their own praying. It comes after their request, teach us how to pray. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. But John 17 is different in that it is the Lord's own prayer uh, to his Father. And in it, we hear his heart, his concern for the Father, uh, for himself, and for those the Father has given him. That is the church, that's you and I. These verses are essentially his last words before his betrayal and arrest that led to his crucifixion. So what I would like to do over the next number of weeks, Lord willing, is to look at Jesus' own prayer and discover what we have in him. And what we have in him is an abundance of provision for living a glorious life. What we have, I'll say it again, what we have in him is an abundance of provision for living a glorious life. And I know that at first glance, this season doesn't, isn't shining with glorious living and it doesn't shout abundance, but it's still the case, uh, beloved. This prayer affirms what Peter tells us, a, a prayer that, a verse I keep going back to, that his divine power has given us everything we need for a life and godliness through a knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and his own goodness. All we need to live an overcoming life, a life of joy, a life of purpose, is actually found in this prayer of Jesus. And, and, and as we will see, circumstances have nothing uh, to do with it. So, I can't think of a better way to start this year than for us to remind ourselves 
of what the Lord has provided uh, for us, to remind ourselves of the prayer that has been prayed uh, for you and uh, for me. But before we dig into this passage in a, in a focused way over the next number of weeks, today I want to consider the context of this prayer. How does it fit with the story that John is telling? And I trust that it will be an encouragement to you and get us pointed, I think, in a life-giving uh, direction. There's so much news today that points us in a, in a death direction, but we need messages that encourage us in a life-giving uh, direction. As I said earlier, these are the last words that are spoken of Jesus to his gathered disciples just before his death. And it's not a prayer that comes out of nowhere. Uh, they've been together uh, all evening. Uh, Jesus has shown them the extent of his love. You'll remember that he washes their feet in John 13. And this act was uh, what this act really mirrors what he's about to do on the cross, taking the place of a servant, uh, bringing cleansing and refreshing through the forgiveness of sin that is, is brought to us through the, the shedding of his blood. And all the while, he's telling them in this, in this uh, scenario, all the while he's telling them that he's going away. He's going to a place that they cannot follow. And that he is leaving them is greatly troubling to the disciples. And that's understandable. Uh, they've been together for some three years uh, they've listened to his teaching. They've witnessed dozens of, of powerful miracles. Uh, they've even shared in that ministry and operated in his authority. So they know firsthand the, the, the presence of Jesus in a power, powerful way. If they had questions, they could go to Jesus and ask questions. He was available and ready to answer. You, Jesus' style was usually to ask another question, even after a question was asked, but he was pointing them toward an answer just the same. Uh, they had thrown their lot in with this man from Nazareth, and now he was leaving. All that intimate fellowship and doing life together was coming to an end. They were deeply troubled, and Jesus knew that. That's why chapter 14 starts uh, with the words, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And because they are deeply troubled at his leaving, the next three chapters, Jesus tells them why it's good for, them, for him to go away. Uh, they would, would, wouldn't be worse off at his leaving, Jesus tells them. They would actually have a greater capacity to live for and to live with Jesus. If you remember those chapters, you'll, you know that the, in those chapters, he promises to prepare a place for them. He promises to send the Holy Spirit, another comforter or, or advocate, to not only be with them, but to actually be in them. He tells them about the real possibility of, of abiding in Christ like a branch abides in a, in a vine. He tells them about the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and how their sorrow will turn to joy. And despite the challenges that they will face, they will have peace. At the end of this sermon, chapter 16, uh, it, en it, it ends this way. He says this, I, to I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Christ's message to them, this troubled bunch, this mess his message to them has come full circle. Don't be troubled, trust in me. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Are they troubled? Yes. Is the world a troubling place? Yes, it is. But they will not face it alone. They face it with the one who has overcome. Again, Peter's words keep coming flooding back to me that his divine power, his overcoming power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Do you realize that if you are a, are, are a Christ follower today, 
the overcoming life has already been provided for you in its fullest measure. Do you believe that? That already it has been bought and paid for, for you. Do you realize that, uh, that there is not one conceivable situation, not a single state of affairs that God has not made provision for? Whatever you face in life, God has a resource to see you through. I hope you believe that today. That's the truth. So why, if it is the truth, why do we live in such defeat? Why do, we, uh, why do the goings on of this world cause us so much fear? How come the future looks so daunting and discouraging when we have these truths that Christ provides everything we need? How come we spend inordinate amount of times on things that are only temporary when we are possessors of eternal life? The truth is that most of our worry, our chronic frustration, our hesitation, our anxiety, our uncertainty and fear is caused mostly by the fact that we don't believe that God has provided what we need to live this life. I'm convinced the more I live the Christian life and the more I interact with people and hear their stories, I'm convinced that most of our unhappiness and discontent comes from the fact that we don't think God is as good as he says he is. We just don't believe it, that he is unable to give us what he has promised. Or maybe we don't even know what he's promised. The great Charles Spurgeon once said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. What's he saying? He's saying, if you know the word of God and you've hidden it in your heart and you allow that word to cultivate in you and allowed it to grow in you to so you can see God for who he really is, then your life is unshakable. Your life is glorious. Your life is full of rejoicing and thanksgiving and praise to God despite what's going, going on. You see, brothers and sisters, we are so rich in him today and yet we live such meager lives. We choose to live meager lives, like live like paupers, even though we are kings and queens. Jesus doesn't want that for his disciples. He doesn't want us to live meager lives. He doesn't want that for us. So along with his teaching, uh, these glorious truths about his provision for them, he concludes his message to them by praying uh, for them. Someone has said that these chapters in John are the, are the greatest sermons ever preached on earth, followed by the greatest prayer ever offered on earth. And I believe that's 100% that's true. Stop for a moment and think about who is praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. It's not like others praying for us. And I don't know about you, but uh, I'm sure you can tell stories of how someone has prayed for you and your, your life is different as a result of prayers. I'm a Christian today because of the prayers of my mothers and the pra my mother and prayer of other family members. I know that uh, to, to be true. Prayer does change things. But imagine, think for a moment, who is praying for us? The very Son of God, equal with the Father. He is the one praying for us and believing for us. Amazing, isn't it? But the Son of God, the eternal Son of God is praying for you, has committed you to the Father and continues to make intercession for you, uh, for your life, for your, for your glorious life that he has for you. Just think for a moment what, what the... If you can say it this way, the success rate of Jesus' prayer life is. That is the, the ratio of prayers offered to the answers given. 
Do you think it's pretty high? The very Son of God knows the Father's heart and prays according to his will. What do you think the, the, uh, the, the success of his prayers are? I, I'm guessing it's 100%. And all we need to do then is agree with him. All we need to do is align our lives to what he has already said, what he has already prayed for us. That's a beautiful thought. And that's where we're going to start today uh, in looking at this prayer of Jesus and begin to dig into the, the truths that are in this so we can discover the fullness of what he has uh, for you and I. But today, I just want to encourage your heart. Are you troubled? Believe in the Lord today. Or is there trouble in your world? I want to encourage you to remember that Christ has overcome the world. That means that, that if he has overcome the world, that means that the troubled world that you have is not actually in control. Your circumstances are not in charge. Christ is. You have to believe that today. If you're going to overcome in this season, you have to believe that today. Know also that he's praying for you praying that, uh, that, not, that not one of the Father's promises, not one of the Father's purposes for your life will be lost to you, but you'll have them all, and you'll live in the fullness of that. He is praying that you experience joy and peace despite what's happening around you. I think this is, could be the greatest time of testimony for the church as others are running here and there. We find ourselves planted on the solid rock who is Christ Jesus. And we're not there in our own power. We're being held by the very power and presence of God. I'm sure that the disciples thought their world was falling apart when Jesus left them. But guess what? It wasn't. And maybe you think your world is falling apart but it isn't Jesus is still Lord you are on his mind and you are in his heart let's pray father I thank you I thank you for sending the son I thank you for his work on the cross in redeeming us thank you Lord for the resurrection that brings us e eternal life and thank you, Lord, that in Christ all your promises are yes and amen. I pray, Lord, that as we continue to look into this prayer, we would discover more about who, we, who you are and who we are in you. And may these truths give us all the resources we need to live in this season. But I pray for that one that is troubled today and living in, trouble, in a troubled world. I pray that you would come alongside them and, re and remind them again of who they are and whose they are. That you have not abandoned them, but you are, they are on your mind and in your heart daily. We are never forsaken. And so encourage them, their, their hearts with the truth of your power, your majesty, and your glory. And Lord, I, I pray that this, in this week we'll find time to rejoice in you. Truly you are the God of the universe and all praise and honor and glory are due your name. May we build ourselves up in the Lord this week and may we be encouraged to be a witness to the people around us. Lord, we thank you for it. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen, amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. I encourage you, let this last song uh, guide and instruct uh, your heart. Bye for now.